morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to our ongoing series on India-Japan partnership perspective. This key initiative is held with the support of the Nippon Foundation to explore the many contours of the essential partnership between our two vibrant democracies. We have a very high powered and distinguished panel this evening to discuss what is so important for the bilateral relationship, the Quad, and Indo-Pacific access, future of Quad and maritime cooperation in the East. We have panelists from four different time zones, US, Singapore, Japan, and India. I'm truly delighted to welcome my first speaker, Michael Green, Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair, CSIS, and Director of Asian Studies, School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University. CSIS is our partner for the US-Japan-India Trilateral Dialogue, and Mike is one of the key persons instrumental in starting this dialogue way back in 2006. The Trilateral Dialogue's first recommendation was that there should be a G2G Trilateral Dialogue, which we know is now very, very active. Thank you for joining us from Washington at this unearthly hour, Mike. Really appreciate that. I'm also glad to welcome um, Dr. Raja Mohan, Director of Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore. We share a close relationship with the Institute of South Asian Studies over the last 14 years. Both our organizations have collaborated over the years to welcome the India-Singapore, uh, to convene the India-Singapore Strategic Dialogue and several other conferences and roundtable sessions. Through this digital session, we have now another platform to take our relationship forward. Thank you, Raja, for joining this discussion from Singapore. It is also wonderful to have with us Professor Tom Taniguchi, Professor of Keio, Keio University, Graduate School of System Design and Management, and Special Advisor to Prime Minister Abe, Shinzo's cabinet, while he was there. Tom has played an amazing role during Prime Minister Abe's time, and he has been a regular member of our Track to Dialogue with Japan. Tom, thank you for staying up so late to address this important session and for your continued support towards our work on Japan and strengthening of this bilateral relationship. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Lastly, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Ambassador Gautam Bambawali former ambassador of India to Bhutan, China, and high commissioner to Pakistan, and a distinguished fellow at Ananta. Welcome, Gautam. It is always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for chairing this important session. With this, may I now hand over the proceedings to Ambassador Bambawale to take this conversation forward. I really look forward to a fascinating and insightful session this evening. Thank you all, and have a great session. Over to you, Gautam. Thank you very much, Kiran, and uh, please bear with me because I'm coming to you over my mobile phone. I have some technical difficulties with a high-speed uh, internet connection. I do hear, I do hope all of you can hear me and uh, see me also. Well, let's dive straight into the subject, which is titled as an Indo-Pacific Axis, Future of the Quad and Maritime Cooperation in the East. Um, let me spend a few minutes in setting the stage and then hand over to our very eminent speakers who will carry on this conversation. Over the last few months, the Quad has taken actions which appear to have strengthened cooperation and coordination between the four countries which make up the Quad, namely the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. First, even during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Quad foreign ministers, as all of you will recollect, met at Tokyo on the 6th of October, 2020. This was something remarkable because even during this period of the pandemic, they all traveled to Tokyo, showing the high importance that they place on 
quad meetings, even at the ministerial level. What was also very interesting was that in remarks to the media, the then US Secretary of State hinted that the quad needed to be institutionalized. Second, the latest edition of the Malabar Naval Exercises held off the coast of India in November 2020 saw Australia being invited for it. And therefore, by that uh, invitation, all four countries of the Quad participated in this very important naval exercise, which became a manifestation of the four-way cooperation between the four nation states. Third, late in 2020, we have begun to see European interest in the Indo-Pacific. In the last quarter of 2020, both Germany and the Netherlands have announced their own Indo-Pacific strategies or approaches. This is in addition to France, who has now even appointed an ambassador in its own strategic, strategic approach. And the UK is likely to announce an Indo-Pacific A lot of European interest in the Indo-Pacific and to set out some kind of strategy paper or approach paper uh, to this region of the world. A fourth very important development which has taken place in this geography, of course, is the signing of the Regional Co Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement or RCEP or RCEP, as some people call it on the 15th of November, 2020. While Japan and Australia are very much a part of RCEP, India stayed out of it at the end. And of course, the United States is not a part of these, was not a part of these negotiations. Now it is quite evident that the concept of the Indo-Pacific or even the establishment of the Quad have emanated due to two factors. The first, of course, is the rapid rise of China and the decreasing power differential between China on the one hand and the United States on the other. And the second development is, of course, the rise to a certain extent of India and its inclusion in this entire equation. In its last days, the Trump administration declassified its 2018 Indo-Pacific strategic framework which was an NSC, a National Security Council document. And it was not to have been declassified till 2043, but was done, uh, was declassified much, much earlier in 2020 itself. And this document clearly states the need for operationalizing the Quad, working with allies and with friends, as far as the US is concerned. One final point before I hand over to the speakers, over this past one year, China's own international behavior has become increasingly more aggressive. It has pursued what is termed as wolf warrior diplomacy. It has been aggressive against its own people in its periphery, both in Xinjiang as well as in Hong Kong. And apart from this, internationally, it has been very aggressive in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Strait, around the Senkaku Islands, on the frontier with India, and in its relationship with Australia. So the big questions which I would like to aim at all three speakers, and uh, we will uh, give them some time to uh, elaborate on these points. The question is, or the questions are, is it time to build and formalize or institutionalize an Indo-Pacific axis? Should it be the Quad or a Quad Plus system, as some people are arguing? How will the Biden administration see the Indo-Pacific as well as the Quad? So far, there have unfortunately been conflicting signals on this subject. Also, how does PM Suga view in Japan view the Quad and the Indo-Pacific? And of course, what are India's and perhaps even Australia's views on it? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of the speakers to speak and give us their initial thoughts and ideas for about seven minutes each, up to seven minutes each. 
uh, you could elaborate on some of the points I've made or, or address some of the questions or make your own uh, remarks. Uh, we will start in the order and go in the order that um, Kiran introduced them. So I'd like to start with Mike Green on the East Coast of the US, then uh, Professor Raja Mohan, who's based in Singapore, and finally, of course, Professor Tom Taniguchi, who's based in Tokyo. Mike, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Gautam. Um, uh, thank you, Kiran. Uh, it is a great pleasure to join you. I was looking forward to this um, distinguished panel, and I was even more impressed yesterday afternoon, uh, US time, when the State Department announced um, that there would be a quad ministerial, and they clearly timed this uh, to occur before our session today to avoid, avoid embarrassment. It's just one more indication of the enormous influence of the Ananta Center and particularly um, uh, the, the members of this panel. You know, the quad as an idea it can be explained in uh, structural terms, the rise of China and so other powers um, align more to counter China's hegemonic ambitions. But that's a very simplistic and boring version of history. And I am a firm believer that uh, grand strategy and the trajectory of nations also depends on ideas. And the Quad is very much an idea uh, with a long history in the United States and Japan and India and Australia. The, the, the genesis of the current Quad really was the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. At the time, I was the senior uh, US official in the White House in charge of Asia, East and South Asia. And I remember about 48 hours after the tsunami struck, um, we were, we, the State Department, the NSC, were um, asked about forming a quadrilateral maritime task force. This was actually an idea that generated and bubbled up from the military themselves because of the deep personal connections that our admirals had with their Australian, Japanese, and Indian counterparts. And within 12 hours, within 12 hours, the, the otherwise uh, frustrating bureaucracies in Tokyo, Delhi, Canberra, and Washington within 12 hours agreed to um, uh, establish this maritime task force and provide public goods, emergency relief across the vast uh, Indian Ocean um, and um, saving many, many thousands of lives. Um, and it was really demonstration that these were four nations that valued more than themselves that valued uh, provision of public goods, that, that shared some common values and common capabilities. But the idea um, had its ups and downs, and, um, and, now it's, and now it's back in full force. I personally think that the Biden administration is very committed to the Quad. I would even argue that for senior officials like our friend Kurt Campbell in the White House, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, the Quad itself will be one of the most important demonstrations that, um, that the Biden administration is embracing a maritime strategy for Asia based on close partnership with democratic um, allies and partners. And this is not an idea that began in 2004, 2005, or uh, Prime Minister Abe's book, Utsukushi Kunie, Towards a Beautiful Country in 2006 when he proposed uh, a quad summit. This is an idea that goes very far back. Um, for the United States, it goes back to um, not only Alfred Thayer Mahan, the maritime strategist um, who really inspires um, uh, you know, American and Japanese uh, thinkers in particular, he was writing in the 1880s, 1890s. It really goes back to Commodore Matthew Perry, who after he um, uh, opened Japan in 1853, came back to New York uh, and gave speeches uh, in 1856 and 1857, predicting that one day the security of the Pacific would be guaranteed by the Royal Navy, the Japanese Navy, and the American Navy. And um, this is a 150-year-old vision. And if, you, and, and if you look back and think, what happened to the Royal Navy? Replace that now with the Indian Navy and the Australian Royal Australian Navy, and you have very much um, Commodore Matthew Perry's vision of the Quad, a very obvious notion that maritime states and in Japan, you had thinkers like Sakamoto Ryoma and Katsukaishu and others around the same time who were arguing for Japan to become a maritime nation. For Japan, for the US and for India and for Australia, there's also a very powerful counter narrative. 
um, more of a continentalist narrative, more of a narrative about stabilizing relations with China, creating a G2. Uh, seven years ago, eight years ago, this was a powerful idea in all four countries. Um, the DPJ in Japan advanced that. Uh, the Labor Party in Australia was attracted to it. Um, and the Obama administration flirted with Xi Jinping's proposal for a new model of great power relations, a bipolar US-China condominium. And in public opinion polls in the US in 2012, when Americans were asked, should we, 2012, should we work more with China or Japan in the future? Actually, the question was with China or with Japan and other allies and partners? Uh, more people chose China. Uh, today, when that question is asked, two thirds of Americans say work with Japan and work with allies. And when thought leaders, we've done this in CSIS surveys, are asked, 82, 83% say work with Japan, work with allies. It reflects the multipolarity of power in Asia, the common uh, bond of maritime powers. And I think that in all four countries now, this is mainstream strategy. And I'd say particularly for the Biden administration, there shouldn't be many doubts, but we can talk about that. Um, there are a couple questions I'm sure we'll get to. Should other countries join? Um, Britain is interested. Canada, New Zealand, the five eyes. Um, the Koreans are even debating this. My own view is we should keep the quad um, and bring in countries on an ad hoc basis. Should the quad be institutionalized? I would argue it should in terms of maritime security. We should think about a standing naval task force because maritime security is the most important uh, purpose uh, of the quad. In other areas like trade, I think it will be harder. Um, India is not where Japan is, and even the US is in a difficult political place on trade. And then we'll have to think through what do we do about democratic values. It's unfortunate that the first major crisis in Asia for the Biden administration and the Suga government is in Myanmar, because Myanmar is the place where India and the US and Japan always fight like, 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 like siblings. Um, old, old, old sibling rivalry about who has the best approach to Myanmar. It's really unfortunate that the test of our commitment to democratic principles is, is Myanmar because it brings out the worst in all four countries. But we're going to have to work together to find paths to advance democracy, including in the tough case of Myanmar. So I'll end there, Gautam. Thank you. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you so much. That was a good uh, summation uh, of uh, your views. Uh, let me just add one um, aspect before we move on to our next speaker, which is Professor Raja Mohan, who's currently based in Singapore, which is to request our participants, our viewers, our listeners, our, uh, to, to start uh, putting your questions into the chat box uh, so that we can take them up as soon as we finish our own discussion. Uh, the earlier questions will be taken up first, of course. So please keep doing so. And with that, uh, Raja, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bombawale. Uh, it's really delighted to be part of this uh, very important panel, I think. Uh, two of them, uh, Michael Green and uh, uh, Professor Taniguchi, were really present at the creation in, in a vague, it was really the Abe administration uh, in Tokyo and then the Bush administration in Washington, where Mike was a key player. But that the ideas in terms of rearranging the architecture of Asia and imagining a specific Indian role in it. I mean, I think it's very easy to relate to those who see Quad in India's uh, centrality. Uh, it was not an easy thing to do when Tom came with uh, Abe San to Delhi, spoke in the Indian parliament about the two to seize an India's role, the connectivity between the two Indian and the Pacific Oceans. And around the same time, when you had uh, Michael Green and the critical position, uh, imagining India's role in a future Asian architecture of transforming US-Japan security relationship and laying the foundations for initially uh, a, a triangular engagement between India, Japan, and, uh, uh, and the US, and later, which formed the kernel to, through which the Quad came. And Gautam, of course, was uh, the one was the initial conversations he had with uh, Kurt Campbell uh, on a triad. I mean, triad is not a right word, but there it is. I mean, that the the before it became quad, uh, the the three-way interaction between uh, uh, India, Japan, and uh, U.S. So I think it really, as as Michael said, look, it is actually a range of ideas that came together. 
And here are people who actually were uh, very central to their evolution. And my own uh, interest has been really in covering it and writing about it throughout this period uh, as an outsider looking at looking in uh, in terms of the new uh, dynamic. Uh, in the limited time I have, I mean, I just wanted to make three quick points. I think we have, uh, uh, Mike has actually laid out the, the big issues. I would say in many ways, the Indo-Pacific concept as well as the, the Quad concept is really about India uh, because it's really putting Indo into the Pacific. I mean, much to the discomfort of a lot of people uh, in India initially, as well as in, in the East, in Singapore, where I am, Southeast Asia, people still ask, I mean, what has Indo got to do with the Pacific? So I remind them that just 70 odd years ago in the Second World War, uh, it was the Indian army that fought with the Japanese, Imperial Japanese army in Burma, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, that it was the Indian army that actually pushed the Japanese out, took the surrender of the Japanese troops in, in Rangoon, in Jakarta, in Hanoi, Singapore, of course. So I think the idea that Indian resources would be critical to shaping the balance of happened after the war was really uh, in India turned inwards uh, and that it became uh, a, a dissociating itself from a colonial period. Uh, but the structure has never changed. I mean, in the sense that uh, that India is critical for shaping the balance of power in this part of the world. And I think what we've seen is really putting these pieces together and the rise of China, uh, which is going to have a growing role in the Indian Ocean. And India's own rise is going to be uh, having, you know, return it to a larger role in the Pacific. So that's the context in which uh, we have the Indo-Pacific. And within that, uh, the Quad, uh, because India is the only one which is not a treaty ally uh, of, of the US, Australia and Japan are. So question of how, what role does India play? How enthusiastic is India uh, about this is the key question. And I think that question has been answered in many ways that um, the previous government in Delhi, the UPA government was ambivalent, hesitant, and not sure whether it was a good idea and whether the, there's enough domestic political support. And I think what the Modi government has done is to break out of those uh, uh, reservations, demonstrate a confidence and a resolve to engage these for mutual benefit. I mean, but I think if you cut through the, the, the catechism on non-alignment strategic autonomy, that India has always partnered countries with which it has, uh, where it can benefit. So I think there is a recognition that where it is to India's advantage to engage, therefore, and that's how the uh, thing has evolved. I must say here that this is not tied to what happened on the border with China. I mean, a lot of people see this for the last two days in the newspapers, oh, we have a border deal, therefore India is going to step back from court. I think the calling the meeting uh, today uh, is, a, is a rebuttal of those who think uh, that it is somehow, it is Chinese have a veto or Chinese are going to decide what to do in the court, I think is fundamentally wrong, that India has longer term interests in a stable uh, Asia, a stable uh, waters of Asia, and that India is going to work with its like-minded partners to, to build this uh, relationship. And I think the pace of it, we can argue, but I think we're going to see a greater Indian uh, embrace, enthusiasm uh, for constructing this. The second, I think, issue is really on the institutionalization. Uh, Gautam, tell me when I'm running out. I mean, on the, I would agree with uh, Michael that, look, it, it, India has to be, the Quad has to be the core. Uh, you can't have an expanding membership and getting into all kinds of issues, but I would say the Quad can be the core and that we can have one continuous engagement because we have to engage the Southeast Asian nations, many of whom are skeptical. Uh, we need to reach out. It's not as if we're imposing the court is going to impose a solution on the rest of the region. We have a lot of work to do with engaging, you know, reaching out to partners, dispelling misperceptions and saying that the court uh, will be a supportive actor in stabilizing this region. And then the other actors, we can build overlapping circles uh, of uh, engagement, for example, in France, uh, India, Japan, sorry, India, France, and uh, Australia have a relationship. India, France are working together in the Western Indian Ocean. So, so I think we can construct a framework in which uh, they can be overlapping circles. But the important thing is what we do, uh, and, and the Quad can be the core. And if you want to do things on the economic front, a Quad Plus, uh, which you saw the last few months, an attempt at constructing it. So I would say the Quad as a, four members being the central uh, uh, organizing uh, group and around which we can uh, uh, step out 
and consider uh, widening, widening circles of engagement. And lastly, I would want to just highlight one important principle of burden sharing. Uh, Indians are not you know, familiar with this, generally with this notion. This idea that, look, somehow we have to be there if American ships are moving into Northeast Asia, that Indian ships must be there. I mean, that is not the understanding, my view at least, that this is about how best we can contribute uh, to the security of the region. That is, uh, that there are multiple ways in which we can divide these responsibilities. In India, that does larger, uh, you know, takes larger responsibility in the Indian Ocean. Uh, US and Japan do a lot more, of course, naturally in, in Northeast Asia. Australia does a lot more in the South Pacific and Southeast Asia. But there are places where we can all meet and do things in Eastern Indian Ocean, in the Malacca Straits where Singapore is, uh, in, the, in the various straits that connect the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. So I think this is not about everywhere, all four of us are going to go like a, uh, uh, like a gang, but, but it is actually that we understand each other, we have a common objectives, and that we work together for stabilizing this region uh, in uh, different ways, and that there will be different people taking lead in different parts. So I would just conclude with the thought of the US expects, US is not going to do what it has done for the last 70 years. If we think we have the luxury of saying Americans will do everything and we have the right to criticize them, that phase I think is changing and that all of us have to contribute. And I think India is ready for that. Japan is ready for that. And that we need to do more in order to make sure that the US stays because the, the sentiment for entrenchment is strong. So therefore the US desire to share the burden more equitably and India's arising India's role to play a larger role in the world fit in nicely and provide the basis for imagining a burden sharing structure where we can create multiple ways in which uh, we can collaborate and coordinate and work together in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Gautam, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Raja. That was uh, excellent. Uh, also, you brought back uh, memories flooding into my head when you spoke about Ambassador Kurt Campbell, with whom I had this dialogue on, the, on Asia and the Pacific. It's indeed good to see Kurt back uh, in, at the National Security Council now. Uh, but to move on, uh, let's move on to Tom uh, Taniguchi. Uh, the floor is yours, Tom. Thank you, Ambassador ba Bauli. Um, let me start by sharing Japanese perspective about the genesis of Quad with you and with the audience. There has always been a strong desire to uh, achieve greater breathing space, wider strategic space. Because if you look at the map, Japan is uh, at the dead end of, let's say, a cul-de-sac. You get uh, easily stifled and suffocated. You constantly, need, you constantly need fresh air. And Japan's security, if you look at the past uh, 70 years, has been on a single leg stool, that is to say US-Japan Security Alliance. Under Shinzo Abe, uh, Japan's policy was to use uh, whatever resources and power available uh, to work as an alliance multiplier. Uh, if you work with Japan, uh, it's almost like uh, buy one and you get uh, two. So Japan uh, started to work very hard with India and with Australia. Personal chemistry also mattered. Uh, Narendra Modi, Shinzo Abe are almost like soulmates. Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull, Scott Morrison, three of the prime ministers in Australia were fascinating. Shinzo Abe developed um, uh, great chemistry with each one of these Australian <laughs> prime ministers. And one day you started to talk more often about Quad. Uh, seen from a Japanese selfish perspective, it's much, much better because uh, you feel that Japan's surrounding sea areas are being sustained and protected not only by the United States, but also by Australia, India, like-minded democracies. Um, 
another element is for many, many decades, perhaps、uh, since Japan started o p e n its doors to the West in the late 19th century, there has been a dichotomy whether you could go continentalist or you could go maritime. If you go overseas, you have、um, wider space,、uh, free、uh, trading regime, and English speaking nations. Uh, there is one thing in common among three partner nations for, for Japan within the Quad、uh, arrangement that is, that、uh, all three nations speak English. And、uh, it's a virtue because if you speak English, it's almost like using Windows uh, uh, operational software. You get、uh, a huge number of applications, and intelligence gathering capability conducted in English is, is much, uh, much uh, uh, advanced. Um, but if you go overland, not overseas, but if you go overland, you get、uh, Russia, North Korea, China, all nuclear powered, none of which is democratic. So、uh, Japan's path actually is very much narrow. You couldn't go overland, you could only go overseas. So Shinzo Abe, at one point in time, I think,、uh, argued. That, aha,、uh -huh, people say the United States is in decline. I don't buy that argument. If Japan gets stronger, if Japan gets more of a trusted partner, not only to the United States, but also to many other nations, primarily Australia, India, the preeminence of the United States, primacy of the United States, would be more sustainable as a result. So,、um, Shinzo Abe, uh, uh, his desire was to use Japan's power as a force multiplier, alliance multiplier. Now, whether Quad can be institutionalized、uh, on a maritime basis, naval to naval exchanges, naval to naval、uh, joint exercises, naval to naval.、Uh, Uh, intelligence gathering, those are the things that could uh, uh, more easily be, be uh, institutionalized. Uh, uh, by the same token, intelligence,、uh, intelligence gathering, intelligence exchanges, and that has to be more institutionalized.、Uh, after all, as I said, uh, uh, if you speak English, you get more in intelligence. And in that sense,、um, uh, there is a wider recognition. At least in the Tokyo's policy forming circle, that Brexit is actually a blessing in disguise. Because as a result, the UK wants to assert that it is still a、uh, global presence, it is st still a uh, uh, P5 nation. As such,、uh, it must、uh, showcase its own capabilities uh, in uh, making itself、uh, felt by more people. In the Indo Pacific region. So, this year, 2020, we'll see、uh, Queen Elizabeth, the newly、uh, commissioned aircraft carrier, Queen Elizabeth and its、uh, battle, battle force group,、uh, will be visiting Singapore, Australia, and Japan. And、uh, my humble hope is that、uh, the United Kingdom、uh, is going to use its、uh, status as a UN military. Uh, as such,、uh, they could use、uh, ports such as Sasebo、uh, very much uh, freely. Um, and then uh, in Europe, uh, France uh, is uh, also looking at uh, the same uh, picture, and it's now reclaiming that it is really a maritime nation.、Uh, uh, after all, France is the biggest in the world in terms of its claimed.、Uh, Uh, exclusive economic zone. It's got small islets and uh, islands uh, on and off、uh, in the Indo,、uh, in Indian Ocean and in the、uh, Southern Pacific. Combined, the uh, amount of uh, uh, the area uh, under uh, Fran French uh, EEZ is enormous. Well, it's already past、uh, seven minutes.、Um, uh, And I、uh, should say just one thing about、uh, institutionalization.、Uh, what's important is to、uh, develop a habit of cooperation, habit of discussion, 
habit of exchanges of ideas. And it's got to uh, take place more often uh, than it is. Uh, so uh, uh, the foreign minister level uh, dialogue is actually about to take place, but why not uh, summit level? Uh, Mao Mohan Singh uh, and Scott Morrison, uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, sorry, <laughs> Yoshihide Suga, and uh, uh, Biden, President Biden, all four standing together would uh, uh, itself uh, uh, send a powerful, powerful, powerful signal uh, to our gigantic neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, all three of you, for those initial remarks and views. Um, you know, uh, there was something which Mike Green mentioned about the importance, uh, something that I would like to explore a little bit with all three of you, really. It is also part of the title of our uh, webinar today, that how do you, um, uh, what is the future of maritime cooperation in the East? So apart from the fact that the four navies have uh, participated in the Malabar exercises last November, we now have the signing of the foundational agreement. J Japan and Australia are already there with uh, being alliance partners with the US. So my question to all three of you really uh, would be that, yes, I tend to agree with Mike that it is important for the Quad to show the flag uh, in the seas of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, what is it that we should be doing? How do we move forward? Should we be carrying out uh, freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea together? Um, would that be a red rag to the Chinese bull? Uh, what uh, would you recommend to be the next steps in maritime cooperation to ensure maritime security in the Indo-Pacific. And perhaps this time we'll go in the reverse order, starting with Tom first, then Raja, and then Mike. So Tom, if we could have your views on, on, on this uh, question, please. Within the next uh, 10 years, there will be more flashpoints uh, in the East China Sea and South China Sea. The fate of Taiwan is uh, at the core of our strategizing. And we need to uh, make the political cost seen from the Beijing, Beijing's perspective of um, uh, militarily provoking Taiwan uh, much, much higher. Well, how, how can we do that? I think it's um, uh, one way to do that is to constantly patrol the areas uh, show, showing the flag uh, as a guardian of the rules-based international order. However, you needn't say anything like that. You just show your presence. Uh, in that sense, the presence of uh, French attack submarine in the South China Sea is a welcome development, and so is Canada's involvement, albeit very much small in size. And uh, Japan and the United States are always doing like that without showing to the world that this is what we do. But the Chinese read that. And you don't have to actually read between the lines. It's so much obvious. Uh, so that's one thing. And in the Indian Ocean, uh, it's, it's more about the future. It's about the development of uh, the eastern, eastern coastal line of African continent, which is extremely resource rich, Kenya, Mozambique, you name it. And uh, as Raja has mentioned all the time, the Indian Ocean is going to be the highway, the industrial corridor for the 21st century economy. And so India, Australia, Japan and the United States uh, must also work uh, together in the Indian Ocean uh, to show again uh, to the uh, other country that uh, they are the ones that are uh, entitled to give uh, the rules-based order to the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Raja, for, for you, please. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, 
But one, one point about Chinese uh, sensitivities, I mean, which you mentioned. Look, I think the, the Chinese are very limited sensitivities. So it doesn't mean that uh, we have to constantly worry about not provoking the Chinese. Uh, I mean, Chinese have every right. I mean, they do things in the Indian Ocean. I mean, it's not that they're asking for India's permission or they worry about Indian uh, you know, sensitivities. Djibouti or some other place, but they're going to do it. I mean, I mean, it's not that you can deny them or you can say, look, we're going to set limits on their, uh, on their activity. So I don't think we should think of they would set limits to what we do. I mean, I think we need to see, is this in our interest? Is this also in public goods for the region? Uh, as long as those criteria are satisfied, uh, then we, we need to meet the Chinese collectively, separately, we, all of us do. Uh, to reassure them, look, this is what we are doing. Uh, so far, I mean, we've asked them to explain to us what the strategy on BRI, they, they, they didn't. Uh, they still don't uh, tell you on what's going on in various parts of their maritime activities. So, so I don't think that should be our constant worry in Delhi. Uh, how might they react? Uh, but we need to engage them. I think because in the end, this is about stability, which means, which is what when the Americans say they're going to talk to them, Japanese are next door. So someday we'll have to work out common CBMs with them, common uh, understandings, but that's that's for the future. But if we don't do anything, we have no role. So, so I would say that's first. Second, I think uh, whatever the outside debate is, I mean, people like me, uh, I believe at least last two, three years, a lot is going on between the marit on the maritime side. I mean, in fact, the progress has largely been on the maritime side where there is, I believe there's greater you know, exchange of maritime domain uh, information. Uh, there is better coordination. So that has already increased. And then you have shared equipment, which today gives you the capacity for interoperability in a way that uh, we did not do uh, before. Uh, and then the foundational agreements, uh, which you mentioned, also provide a basis. Uh, we also, I think that foundational agreements in turn lead us to using each other's facilities. That is, if India can access American facilities in other parts of the Indian Ocean. Uh, Japan has a base uh, in Djibouti. Americans have a base in Djibouti. Uh, even the Koreans have a base in Djibouti. So, so I think uh, if we can say, look, we can improve the efficiency of our operations by merely routinely exchanging and using others' facilities to improve our own capability. Third, I think the problem so far has been we've not done any joint operation. We've done a lot of exercises. We share information, but there have been no joint operations. So I think we could start with some joint operations, uh, for example, on HADR, uh, which I think it's a good place to start, given the Eastern Indian Ocean as the main prime site for uh, continuous uh, disasters. And after all, uh, Mike and Tom talked about 2004, Boxing Day, sure. uh, NAMI, and that's when actually we began to do things together. But now I think we need to give that a more sustained basis that we do things together, the four navies, the four forces in one way or another, that I think will set a good, and it can start with something very simple, like a humanitarian assistance or disaster relief. Uh, that itself will, uh, will, I think, set the stage. And then there are other stuff to do, capacity building for the smaller nations, helping the smaller island states guard their uh, territories. Uh, so there is, I think the sky is the limit because we barely started doing anything. So, so I think the moment we agree on joint operations, I think that itself will set the stage uh, for the next steps that we can, we can build on. Um, I agree very much with what Tom and, and Raj said, and I um, would in particular emphasize the importance of letting the maritime services, uh, the Navy, the Marine Corps for us, the Coast Guard to some extent, letting them really drive the agenda and push uh, forward, um, in part because the area where the US, Australia, Japan, India are in almost total agreement is that we will not um, uh, tolerate Chinese hegemonic ambitions over the maritime domain. We have differences on democracy. We have differences on trade. We have differences even on BRI. But on this maritime question, I think there's very strong uh, alignment of views in all four countries. And our navies in particular um, see the picture very much the same. So this, this more ambitious agenda should go to the maritime services, as, as Tom and Raj said. I think we have to remember also the Chinese strategy. In 2008, um, the Central Military Commission 
promulgated the near sea doctrine. Um, this is 12, 13 years ago. And the initial stage was to contest the first island chain, the East China Sea and South China Sea. And the second stage was con to contest the second island chain, uh, Guam and, um, and, and, uh, and further into the Pacific. I think that the PLA is now into the next stage of their doctrine, which is to contest the Indian Ocean and the Pacific uh, islands, which is why there was this interest in a submarine base in Vanuatu in more access in the Indian Ocean. In a naval fight, uh, the Chinese will lose, the PLA Navy will lose in the Indian Ocean and they'll lose in the Pacific. But if the Royal Australian Navy, if the US Fifth Fleet are first forced in the early stages of a crisis to divert assets to protecting these broad uh, ocean areas and access points beyond the first and second island chains, it dilutes the source resources that are available within the first island chain for the US Navy, for the Royal Australian Navy especially, and for the Indian Navy, uh, of course. And so I think um, we need to think about the, um, the longer term mission of maritime security also being uh, the ability for what people call deterrence by denial. Uh, to remind the Chinese that to secure resources from the Middle East, they have to be able to get through the US 7th Fleet, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Forces, the Royal Australian Navy, and the Indian Navy. And particularly in undersea warfare, the US, Japan, and Australia will be extremely difficult for the Chinese to deal with for decades to come. Um, and so that really is the next stage. Humanitarian disaster relief, joint operations, yes, I would say the next stage is really working with these four navies on undersea warfare, um, uh, air defense, and high-end joint operations. And it's a rheostat. We will turn it up when we need to. A lot of this can happen quietly, but we can signal to the Chinese. And we have to remember that ASEAN is not capable of doing this. We can do things bilaterally with Vietnam. We can do things with Indonesia increasingly, maybe Singapore, Philippines, we, we, the US can do and Japan can do. Uh, but ASEAN is, is the, the quad has to exist with the assumption that ASEAN will never have solidarity or consensus and will always be picked apart. And we have to provide the stabilizing diplomacy and maritime security around ASEAN to make it possible for ASEAN countries to resist Chinese coercion with more confidence. Um, but for us, the play within ASEAN, I think is going to be very limited and it's going to be very bilateral. Um, and we have to shore up what, what is beyond ASEAN uh, to give more strength and confidence to those friends within ASEAN that are under Chinese uh, coercion. Thank you. Thank, thank you all three of you. Um, that was really, really interesting. And thank you for sharing your thoughts. I, I'll use my prerogative as the chair to ask one more question before I move to questions which are flowing into the inbox and the chat box and the Q&A box. And that question is that while there is little doubt that the Indo-Pacific strategy is mainly a security uh, focused strategy, do you think that there is a requirement for our Indo-Pacific approach for the Quad to also have an economic aspect to its uh, approach and strategy in this part of the world, in this region? Uh, do we need to uh, also have some kind of economics uh, uh, strategy? Is the Blue Dot Network something that we should be pushing? Uh, is the Blue Dot Network something that India should be joining? Uh, does India have the credentials to join the Blue Dot Network or is it something else that we need to create? Um, let, let's uh, move it again in the initial direction. So start with Mike and end with Tom. Uh, Raja, I'm afraid you're always uh, sandwiched in between. So um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but when questions come up from the floor, from uh, the participants, you'll definitely get the first word. So let's start with Mike on that. Well, um... I, I would say the prevailing view in Washington, and I agree with it, is that um, India is not a natural partner for the United States on trade, particularly when you're talking about tariff reduction or traditional um, WTO consistent trade agreements. Um, to tell you a little secret, when RCEP was created, some academics hyperventilated, um, but many of us thought, we don't have to worry because India's in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was only when India left that RCEP was finally completed. So I would be very, a little bit blunt, but say trade, traditional trade agreements 
I someday that should be what we do together, but it's not what the US and India and Japan are really going to do together today. Um, uh, infrastructure, yes, the US, Japan, Australia have a very um, close collaboration on what we call FOIP, Free and Open Indo-Pacific. The Biden administration will continue that and we should cooperate with India, but I think that will be limited. I would say in the economic realm, the area where the quad probably has the most potential is 5G. Mm -hmm. um, the US, Japan and Australia are, are, I think, very closely aligned on our policies to stop Huawei and Chinese companies from entering our 5G markets. And together, the US, Japan and Australia have uh, somewhere around 40, 45% of the global 5G market. So we will be at the core of developing a non-Chinese 5G network, but it will be expensive. <laughs> um, and so if India, which is debating this, aligns more with the national security view on 5G, um, having India in that 5G um, strategy would be enormously uh, important. And I, I would make that a priority in the economic realm is technology, security, um, 5G, where India has a real casting vote with the developing world and would be a really important voice if we can cooperate on that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, already, for example, there was this uh, dialogue that began between Japan and Australia and India on resilient supply chains. So this idea that, look, you need to, we're not going to walk away from China fully on um, the interdependence between China and the other developed countries like Japan and the US is so deep. But diversification of supply chains is now uh, a clear trend. And I think India wants to draw supply chains in. And I think conversations have begun on that. And I think uh, there is a lot more we can do. So, so I would say that is one area that is already being discussed by the three countries. I'm sure it can be extended. In the case of immediately after the pandemic hit us, uh, the Quad Plus conversation that the USA had convened, uh, particularly in the pharma sector, in the health domain. So there are ideas in terms of how we can work together. So that again is an open one. On uh, 5G, on the tech issues, uh, quite clearly there is, you know, we'll see what happens at the London summit. I don't know, it's being called a G7 plus three or is it a D10 or uh, whatever it is called. Uh, that we, the idea that, that actually started with the notion that uh, we need to have some collaboration on, on technology related issues. Uh, including on the telecom and the on the digital side, so so I think that conversations too. I mean, I think in Washington, a lot of new ideas in terms of T10, T12, how the techno democracies must come together. So so I would say there are a, a good basis for starting this. But let me just—I don't want to argue with Mike on U.S. domestic <laughs> politics, but my sense is the U.S. is not going back to the Obama period or the Bush period approach to trade. The talk about middle class, a foreign policy for the middle class by the Biden administration, uh, when the national security advisor Jake Sullivan says it's not Washington's job to open other markets for Goldman Sachs, uh, that is about finding jobs for the US. So in some sense, my view, I mean, I could be wrong, are some rearrangement of the global trading system are to, because China walked in and has exploited it to its advantage. So some rearrangement is going to be necessary. There, I think there's a lot of political room uh, for all of us to, to work together to set a new term. Look, if it doesn't work for the Americans, uh, there's no way the system is going to survive. I mean, I know that at least some in Delhi say, oh, these are the rules of WTO. WTO was not made by Moses or you know, Krishna or some god. Uh, that was a negotiated political arrangement. And people say, look, that arrangement is being undermined by Chinese economic power. Therefore, we need rearrangement. So they talk about reform. The Japanese have been on the lead on that in a number of areas. Singapore, there are a whole lot of countries. So, so I think there is going to be some way of rethinking, not discarding, rethinking, rearranging the global trading system. There, I think there is a lot that India can do with the US and Japan and, and other, other partners. And then climate change. Now, climate change is an economic issue. In the end, it is about the energy industry and how do you distribute the costs of changing from one type of energy, which is the foundation today, to another type. Uh, and so there, I think, uh, it is at the top of Biden administration's agenda. And my sense is uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi has also thrown a number into the ring. I don't think many international press has followed it. Uh, Biden says 2050. Xi Jinping says before 2060. Uh, but Mr. Modi has said uh, 2047. I, I, I don't think it got picked up that India is, will be there at the 100th anniversary of its independence 
to be able to shape the global uh, this, you know, structure on, on climate change. So, so I think India is going to be very much part of it. And that is going to be one of the biggest things that we're going to see happen between India and the US. So I would say there's more than enough uh, for the Quad to start working together uh, on, on a range of economic issues. Right, uh, we're looking at a time space of um, about one entire generation. 2049, China is going to celebrate its centenary since uh, the start of the People's Republic of China. And it just so happens on the 23rd of July, the Chinese Communist Party is going to uh, celebrate its own party's centenary which is actually going to coincide with the opening day for the Tokyo Olympic Games. Over the next uh, 29 years, you have to uh, seek two goals. Uh, you must be economically robust and you must build your uh, strategic um, power, military primarily, even stronger. So each nation has to seek two ways. And I think it's very much uh, difficult for an old nation, uh, such as Japan, to uh, aim at achieving 3-4% growth. Uh, but anyhow, that's the path you need to go. And you need to go in tandem with other nations rather than going alone. So that's the foundation on which uh, Japan must uh, uh, build its future economic uh, and strategic policies. So either way, uh, that ja the future of Japan is going to be hinged on whether or not uh, Japan could maintain uh, its um, uh, formidable relationships with those nations. Quad has an economic relevance uh, for that matter. Uh, but again, I would um, say the same as uh, Mike said, uh, in terms of the traditional trade uh, sort of thing, uh, I think uh, uh, Quad is not going to play an instrumental role. After all, Quad has been centrally focused, solely focused on geostrategic issue because for Australia, China is the biggest trading partner. For Japan, China is the biggest trading partner. For the United States, China is the biggest trading partner. So uh, you need to cut a fine balance uh, between your reliance on the Chinese market power uh, and uh, your pursuit of um, ultimate uh, freedom, freedom of uh, movement, freedom of thoughts, and freedom of uh, 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 navigation, and so on and so forth. So which is why Quad uh, has to be focused on the uh, single side uh, of the uh, uh, of the coin, if you like, the other side is uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, economic, which is very much dependent on the Chinese market. Uh, however, the Chinese uh, growth is not going to be as uh, uh, fast as has been uh, down the road. Um, so uh, you must uh, get uh, prepared for. Uh, ups and downs in many ways of the Chinese uh, future economic trajectory. After all, uh, I am saying the same thing. Quad uh, is so designed as would give the member nations with um, uh, security policy, both in terms of uh, uh, national security, military, and in terms of uh, economy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, uh, I found comments by Mike Green on 5G. Uh, very, very interesting because uh, you are absolutely right, Mike, that 5G is the intersection of economy, technology, uh, and also to a certain extent politics. Uh, and I believe for one, and I may be one of the few in India who uh, are still saying this or are saying this, that I think politically India is ready to pay a higher economic price for a more secure 5G and 6G system as we move ahead. So I think uh, uh, you've hit the nail on the head. I, I believe that um, India is very ready 
to participate in a kind of um, economic access on the technology front as far as communications technology is concerned. Uh, let me now move on to some of the questions which are in the, in the chat box, in the question box. Uh, and the first group of questions actually deals with the whole issue of the quad plus. And uh, many people have, uh, have asked this that, um, is Korea prepared to uh, be a member of the Quad Plus? Do you think they uh, want to be a member of the Quad Plus? The same questions are raised vis-a-vis -vis Indonesia. Uh, are, uh, are these countries really ready and willing and wanting to be a member of an expanded Quad? Um, and if not, then should we uh, just turn to some of our traditional partners from Europe, whether it's France or the UK, or even the Netherlands and the EU. So let me ask this group of questions to all of you. Uh, perhaps we could start uh, first with Raja, because Raja, you, I'm, I'm sorry I have to have sandwiched you in between, but let's start with Raja, move to Tom, and then finally to, uh, to, to Mike. No, I think these questions look, uh, you know, one, how many of who's going to be a member, who's going to be not a member. I mean, I think that's really, as we said, look, if there is a, a core group and we have to engage the other critical uh, partners in the region. Uh, we've seen that uh, in the you know, last six months, last eight months of the Trump administration, there were Quad Plus meetings, uh, which involved South Korea, uh, Vietnam. There was uh, Brazil in one of those, I think. There was uh, uh, Israel in one of those. Uh, so, so I think whether, but no one is talking about it now, in a sense, in an institutionalized form. But I think it, it should be that, uh, I think all of governments are, capable of taking, undertaking flexible approaches that if we need to engage, uh, you know, Europeans on some issue, we need to engage the South Koreans on some issue. Uh, I think we need to take that on that basis rather than saying, look, this is not about counting new members, uh, that it is really wherever it is possible, uh, we could we could work on uh, those kind of uh, uh, engagements. So, so I wouldn't worry about that uh, too much at this stage. The other aspect I, I think is, the 5G related issues, I mean, I think which has really been, I mean, you asked about that question. I, I think there is uh, going to be on, on technology related issues. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more cooperation among us. So I would say, look, leave it flexible that you have a core, leave the rest flexible rather than saying who is in, who is out. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be very off-putting to the others that we go to people and say, look, uh, you know, you're not a member, you are a member. We don't need to do that. I think where functionally, wherever we can work with whoever is willing to work with us, we should we should take it. And I think on security, France has already talked in a fairly deep way. Uh, Britain uh, wants to come back to the east of Suez. Uh, there are ways in which we can collaborate with them. They have something called the five power defense arrangement. Uh, if that arrangement wants to work with US, India and Japan, it will be fine. So, so, so I would say uh, be flexible, be creative rather than do the schematic you know, organizational chart type of approach to, so this is not going to be APEC, this is not going to be ASEAN, this is not going to be even NATO. So I think let's be, uh, you know, we don't have to use those models. It is uh, be practical in terms of what we need to do. If France as a player in Southwestern Indian Ocean wants to do things with that, we should do things with that. And if, if today Britain is stopped taking the lead on uh, 5G, that's how they started it. Uh, Australia was the first one to really take this issue on head on. So th that opens up space. And if G7 plus three gives us some room to talk about this issue, we do it there. And not to get too obsessed about organizational format uh, in terms of the coming years. Tom, would you like to come in on this one? Well, in a way, name creates reality. So when you started to call the gathering quad, uh, it uh, started to project an image that as if Quad is a, some kind of entity or institution, which Quad is not. So it's too early to say who can be invited and who cannot be invited. Um, let's just keep Quad the way it is now, uh, a gathering of ministers, a gathering of service uh, members, and so on and so forth. Um, in reality, uh, South Korea, at least under the current administration, is not interested. Uh, and the strategy of South Korean Navy 
is confusing. Uh, at uh, some uh, sometime, it appears as if uh, the naval buildup, which is uh, accelerating uh, in South Korea, is aimed not at its northern neighbor or China, but primarily at uh, Japan. Um, and uh, if uh, things go uh, that way, uh, it would be uh, pragmatically difficult for anyone to talk about uh, South Korea becoming more interested in Indian Ocean or the Pacific. Indonesia, well, it's uh, the most important nation in ASEAN, and it's a hugely uh, proud nation. Uh, it's obvious that uh, Jakarta is paying keen attention on uh, Quad, uh, but they're not interested at all now and down the road in getting forced to choose one side or another. So that's about India. Canada is uh, interesting. It's very low key, low profile. Uh, it shows no interest. Uh, however, it is uh, very much keen on playing a role in Quad. So um, you might uh, want to talk more about involving Canada uh, in Quad. So I, the most um, compelling reason we've heard to not expand the membership is because the name would be so horrible. Can you imagine having a conference in three years on the future of the sept or the quint? <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't roll off the tongue. I think, uh, you know, the quad sounds great. So don't change the name. The other thing is, if you do start having four membership expand, it actually limits how many countries can participate. Because let's say, for example, the UK joins and Canada joins. Then if Korea wants to participate or Indonesia, there will be an expectation they're going to join. The debate will be much more complicated for them. Whereas if it's very clear it's the four countries, the quad, and we welcome others to participate on an ad hoc basis, we will get more countries participating. So I think if the idea is to demonstrate uh, uh, consensus or broad support for maritime security and democratic norms, better to keep it to the quad. And let's remember that um, uh, some of the countries we're talking about, Canada, Britain, uh, Korea, they are more interoperable with the US Navy than India is. And in some cases more interoperable than Japan is. So it will not be difficult operationally for NATO countries, Five I countries or Korea to plug in to the operational things. Um, I'd just like to say a quick word on Korea. Um, the Korean government right now is just absolutely frustrating uh, for almost everyone, uh, especially Japan. Um, the idea of strategic ambiguity that the uh, Blue House in Seoul puts out, it's not strategic ambiguity, it's, it's an invitation for China to try to dominate the Korean Peninsula. It's very frustrating. But I'll say this about our Korean friends. Um, if you look at public opinion polls in Asia, the country where people are the most supportive of US forward military presence and alliance relations is Korea. And look, remember back to the Gulf, uh, to the Iraq war, um, the largest contingent of troops on the ground in Iraq was Korea, it was US, Britain, Korea. The Koreans sent over a brigade of troops. And this was a very progressive, almost anti-American government, no Hyun. Why did they do it? Uh, because they believed in the mission in Iraq. They did it for a very transactional reason. They wanted the Bush administration to soften its stance on North Korea. And so they sent troops. And I'll tell you, I was there. It worked. We softened our stance on North Korea um, and engaged in more diplomacy. And so there are debates now in Seoul about a similar transactional move. Uh, I don't think we will expand formal membership, but I would not rule out Korean participation. Um, I think it's possible. And I think um, it would send a very strong signal if we can achieve it. So I, I, I wouldn't rule it out. I just put it that way. Thank you. Thanks uh, to all three of you. Uh, there is a particular question on Russia, which I guess is um, aimed at Raja because you are representing India's views. Uh, and the question is this, that um, how can India convince Russia that the Indo-Pacific uh, concept, the Indo-Pacific approach, the Indo-Pacific strategy is not uh, inimical to Russia, is not aimed at Russia apart from China? Uh, how does uh, how can India convince uh, Russia on that? Convince Moscow on that? And so that uh, question is basically for Raja. And there's a related question for Mike, 
which is that uh, if India continues to uh, purchase weapons platforms from Russia, uh, will uh, the United States impose sanctions or will you waive sanctions uh, on such purchases? So first Raja and then Mike, please. Look, I mean, I don't see why India should take the task of convincing the Russians about the Indo-Pacific. Look, Russians have been uh, in the statecraft business for more than a thousand years. Uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, it's not that uh, they're doing this because they don't believe, if I were to put in quotation marks, the uh, words of the Indo-Pacific. For them, it is about staying with the Chinese at this point of time. So for them, the priority is the Chinese relationship. And the problem with the West means they're not going to support any strategic initiatives of the West at this time. But if they have a deal with the Americans at some point of time, I mean, how they look at it. So they're going to look at it from their perspectives. I mean, I think we should accept. Russians have a different perspective. We have a different perspective, but we will keep talking. That doesn't stop. Just because we differ on the Indo-Pacific doesn't mean we don't do anything with the Russians. Uh, take the G Europeans, for example, Germany, uh, where Americans, as Trump always used to say, defending Germany and Germany goes to the Russians to get gas. Uh, U.S. Congress has passed a legislation which says uh, if Germans continue with uh, Nord Stream, there will be sanctions. So, so I think it is a complex world. I mean, I, I think we should respect others have a difference. I mean, it's not that we have to agree with everyone on everything. So the Germans still have a problem. I don't know how they're going to finish that. I mean, maybe Mike can tell us how the German question is going to work on this one. So there are, there are going to be issues here. So we're not, it's not our job to convince the Russians. The Russians are not babes in the wood. Are they playing statecraft? I mean, in my lifetime, I've seen Russia and America. I mean, I was not born in the Second World War. They collaborated. Uh, in the 1950s, they fought like hell. In the 1960s, uh, Russia, China fought. I mean, and in the 1950s, Russia and China were on the same side. And now Russians and the Chinese say they're the best strategic partners. All this in the last 40 years. Allies today, not allies tomorrow. So I don't think we should worry too much about it. In between, Americans and the Russians have a little detente. Uh, uh, so I think we should see what the Russians are doing. We should understand their concern, but that doesn't mean we have to agree with them. They don't like Indo-Pacific, so be it. Uh, they don't like a lot of, we don't like some things they do. So, so I think it, it's not uh, contingent upon us as if we are obliged to convince the Russians. Russians are exercising with the Chinese, sometimes against the Japanese. They're exercising with South Africans in the South China, in uh, Southern African waters. So this stuff goes on. I, I think we should not worry too much about Russian sensitivities. I mean, the, we understand each other. The foreign secretary is there right now. So we have differences on some. We live with those. Uh, it's, um, you know, in the 1850s, when uh, Commodore Perry was proposing the Quad, he argued that it was necessary to stop the Slavic people, the Russians, from expanding into the Pacific. So the idea was that Russia was our enemy. Um, when Alfred Thayer Mahan proposed it in the 1890s, he said, yes, the Russians, and someday the Indians. <laughs> so um, who knows who this is supposed to be against? I think we should really think about what the Quad is for, and it's for an open uh, rules-based maritime architecture and, uh, and, and preventing coercion uh, against the maritime domain. Um, and I don't, uh, I, I don't think that, that we should particularly, we should, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time worrying about confidence building with Russia or China. They'll make their own judgments. They're extremely cynical strategic thinkers. Um, we can count on that. Um, in terms of the S-400s, um, I personally do not think the U.S. will sanction India. Uh, the geopolitical price would be too high. And, and to be really candid, the political power of the India caucus in Congress is considerable now. Um, uh, I do, however, think there will be a negative impact on U.S.-India relations. And um, it, I think, is going to um, limit the ability of the U.S. and India to work together on defense industrial uh, cooperation and technology transfers. It's going to make it much more complicated to develop systems together um, and, to, and, and, to, and to, you know, move forward. But there are constituencies in both countries that would be very happy to not do that um, anyway. So it's just going to further complicate the enormous potential that's, that's there for the US and India to do more in terms of developing new systems and technologies together. This will just be one more 
uh, obstacle to that, unfortunately. But I don't think sanctions or a breakdown in, in strategic cooperation is likely to happen. Good. Then uh, there's a question which I think is very direct and also provocative. I think uh, um, uh, the questioner is trying to uh, scratch all three of you so that you'll um, you know, come out with more uh, radical ideas and thoughts. And the question is as follows, that what is the Quad uh, going to do about the artificial islands that the Chinese have made in the South China Sea and which they had promised at one time not to militarize, but which have been militarized now. So what does the Quad intend to do about these artificial islands? Uh, perhaps we'll start with Tom, then Mike, and then finally Raja just uh, you know, trying some permutations and combinations. So Tom first, please. Well, the answer is very little. Uh, if you do anything military towards those already existing artificial islands, uh, it's almost uh, similar to uh, declaring war against China. That said, you need constant presence in South China Sea even if South China Sea has become almost Beijing's lake, uh, it's still international waters, which is why uh, the French presence, its uh, sending of uh, nuclear powered uh, attack uh, submarine is welcome. The small constabulary, uh, constabulary boat, the UK is planning uh, to uh, operate in the South China Sea is similarly welcome. The constant presence of Indian naval power uh, is also a, an encouraging development. Combined, you can send a unified signal, unwavering signal to the Chinese that this is not your lake. This is open international waters. And so uh, the only thing you could do is to uh, make the political cost as high as possible. But I like this question because, uh, you know, just a year ago, people are saying, look, what is Quad? It's crazy. I mean, uh, the kind of opposition that was there in India uh, to even have a nuclear deal with the Americans, uh, or that any, it took 15 years to negotiate the LSA, saying, look, anything we do with Americans is going to undermine us. Uh, now we're being asked, show me, what, has you done? what have you done? What can you do in just one year? So I think ideas will take time to evolve. Uh, and we've seen last one year, one and a half year, there's things have moved. So I think it's not that everything is going to be designed according to a plan, that that circumstances are going to drive a lot of this uh, cooperation, but that uh, the more assertive China is, and as Biden uh, kind of said the other day, President Biden, uh, Chinese will eat our lunch. I mean, if that is the case, and the lines have to be drawn somewhere, I think U.S. policy would, 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 get, would get harder for India, too. I mean, I think if India's deterrence requires greater activism on the maritime front and not just a blocking action, a defensive actions on the Himalayas, India is going to do more things. So, so I think I would say the story has just begun. This is work in progress rather than at this point to say, will you do X? Will you bring me the moon or from two years ago saying, look, uh, it really, it's really not a worthwhile idea. I think it's it's really unfair at this point to get into that kind of an argument. Uh, we have moved some distance, and my sense is the circumstances have been never been more favorable to this idea of these four countries getting together. And we, we're likely to see uh, quite a bit of a progress in the next few years, especially on the maritime domain. And I think we should uh, stick to that rather than a priori knowing exactly what India will do, uh, sorry, what the Quad will do, in every circumstance, in every sphere, and in every domain uh, that's available in the world. So the, the specific um, the geopolitical and operational challenge posed by China's, uh, their four main artificial islands in the South China Sea are, are considerable. I mean, those um, islands now have the ability to take every aircraft in the PLA Air Force inventory and to provide constant fighter cover over the entire South China Sea. Uh, able to overwhelm any Southeast Asian Air Force easily. And that's, that's a problem. And also to provide air cover for the PLA to turn the South China Sea into more of a submarine bastion for high-end uh, operations against the US and Japan and India and Australia. So I think the Quad's quite relevant 
to what's happened with the artificial islands in the South China Sea. But what we do about it operationally will be very different. I mean, the US and Japan and uh, increasingly Australia are moving towards um, new capabilities and new operational concepts, standoff strike weapons, more amphibious operations, um, what, um, uh, you know, more mobile units on smaller islands. Um, I think for the Quad, there are two, probably two things uh, that will become increasingly relevant. One will be um, the ability to engage in joint operations beyond the South China Sea. In other words, denying the PLA access uh, to sea lanes beyond the South China Sea, potentially, potentially, as a way to dissuade China. Uh, and the other is, I think, uh, the US, Japan, Australia already do it, but um, not, uh, not, not freedom of navigation operations within the 11 nautical miles of these islands, but rather, I think, transiting the South China Sea and demonstrating clearly its international waters. China does not own the South China Sea, and it does not it does not yet dominate it. It's still contested, and we should contest it back by by increasingly um, um, sailing through. And um, uh, we don't have to go within eleven nautical miles. That's what the U.S. does. We're we're good at that. So there are some. I think this will increasingly come onto the agenda, um, and uh, be very relevant. Uh, thank you all for those uh, remarkable replies. Um, I, I think um, taking off from Mike's initial comments on Myanmar where uh, the Quad countries have considerable difference of opinion. Um, uh, there are uh, a few questions from our participants on Myanmar. And uh, the line of questioning is basically that if you want to constrain China, or if you want to contain China, if you want to block the rise of China, then Myanmar is a very important uh, entity, a very important player in this whole um, approach or strategy. So isn't it time for the Quad to further coordinate uh, their approach to, be, to Myanmar, especially because there are issues there with the military having taken over? Uh, so shouldn't we be doing something about our positions on Myanmar? Um, let's start with Mike and then uh, move on uh, in the reverse direction. As, as I noted at the outset, it's really bad luck for the Quad countries that the first major crisis in Asia is Myanmar, which um, it's like an old family feud, you know, <laughs> that, that uh, you never want to come up at the dinner table because it will ruin the conversation. Um, I, um, I think we, we, we can have an approach, we should have an approach where India will be much more engaged with the, with the military in Myanmar than the US will. That's, that's fine. India has its own reasons um, for, because of security on its border and other issues to engage. And, uh, and that's, that's fine with me. And Japan has a unique relationship with uh, Nepeda uh, as well. And that's fine. <clears throat> um, I, as the US uh, builds an international coalition to put economic pressure on the regime, um, I think Japan should be more a part of that. I think Japan should look more like Britain or Australia than like Singapore in this instance. Um, um, and uh, we need to remember that the strategic competition with China and Myanmar is not just that you, this is not a unitary actor. We're not talking about whether we engage the, the government in power or not. We have to remember that the people in the long run will matter. And it will be very, very important that uh, Japan and the US and India as democracies demonstrate support for the people of Myanmar who are out in the street. We can all do it in different ways, but I think it's, it's, it's really important to recognize that there is a a competition for power on the chessboard among nation states, but also within Myanmar. And in the long run, we want Tokyo, Delhi, Canberra, and Washington to be on the side of the people of Myanmar. Now, how we do that will vary, but in the way we express it, in the way we articulate it, in the, in the, we need to show that we have that in common um, and that we're not at odds um, in that critical aspect of this problem. But it's really vexing and very, very difficult. It's so many ways, it's really a reprise of the exact arguments uh, we used to have uh, in, the, uh, in the 2000s and then with uh, Bush and the Obama administrations. Uh, but, but I think what we've learned in the last decade is that, look, the fight between civilians you know, led by Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, the, the military uh, establishment, uh, you know, that is one line of, of one cleavage that, that we've had to deal with. That fight is not over. I mean, the people are on the streets. Uh, we don't know exactly which direction it is going to go. Second, the very people who are demonstrating against the military are also the ones who are not going to give an inch on the Rohingya issue. 
So we should be clear that the Burman nationalism that, you know, remember Suchi was derided for supporting Burman nationalism. So I think there are going to be uncomfortable outcomes uh, in a large and important geopolitically located society, which, which you know, is still in the process of nation building. And I think the, the multiple lines of conflict there, and it's, it's going to be pretty hard uh, for, uh, for, for both India and China, for example, they've had serious trouble dealing with the Rohingya issue. How do you deal with two friends, uh, Burma and Bangladesh? So, so I think we all will have problems in dealing with those kind of situations. But I would say uh, that just because we have differences doesn't mean we, we, can, we can't coordinate. Uh, the Americans do it very well, the good cop, bad cop uh, routine, uh, that actually you can uh, you know, use your different uh, equities and leverages uh, with another country to be able to nudge them towards a better outcome. That I think can be done. I think we've seen some of that uh, in Sri Lanka and Maldives over the last few years. Whenever there was a major political crisis, we saw the EU and the US put a lot of pressure uh, on uh, those, you know, both the, uh, both on the you know Yamin government and then on the Sirisena government in Sri Lanka. And India was somewhat different, but was supportive of the outcomes that eventually came in favor of a democratic uh, uh, governance in both the both the islands. So, so I think we can still coordinate while differences will remain. And I think distance is a big, uh, you know, if you're far away, it's easy to take, I mean, clear positions, but the closer you get, it gets messier. And when you have a historic relationship like Japan has with the Burma, uh, there are other uh, complications. But I think we need to keep in touch with each other, uh, stay engaged in terms of what we do. And uh, so that it's what each of us does uh, gets better if you understand the complexity of the dynamic that is unfolding uh, within Burma at this point. Myanmar came to Japan and request that the Japanese aid provider, JICA, work together with Myanmar government to replace all the elementary school textbooks with new ones. So the Japanese uh, government, uh, actually JICA, is working closely with Myanmar to create future generations. And I think the aim here is to develop uh, a mindset, a habit of mind of not going war against anyone within the country and spending a lot of time creating democracy uh, from grassroots. Uh, but it's uh, being interrupted by events like this. Uh, two things here, how Japan should do uh, going forward. One thing is, uh, the more I hear from Raja and other people uh, from India, the more convinced, uh, convinced uh, I have become that uh, there is untapped, uh, untapped reservoir of knowledge and experiences that in India could give uh, the other, uh, I mean, the rest of the world, including Japan. So Japan's uh, foot soldiers of aid provision uh, for instance, uh, might uh, perhaps be able to work more closely with the, the Indian counterpart. And when it comes to sanctions, the sanctions that the United States is talking about are more advanced, I would imagine, more pinpoint, if you like. And I think if you pick up uh, a group of uh, military leaders and then make them uh, uh, targets, in a very much pinpointed fashion, uh, I think it'll work. And uh, it will work not uh, while uh, not jeopardizing the people's uh, living standards. So uh, sanctions in that, of that kind uh, can be uh, more advanced and more creative. And I think there is room uh, for Japan, uh, for that matter, to cooperate with the United States. Here's one quick idea for you, <clears throat> Gautam, because I think yes, our audience yes. wants our audience wants us to be a little bolder. Yes. Um, and um, we have a quad ministerial uh, convening shortly. Um, and I just made this up, by the way. I don't know that this is going to happen. But what if the quad announced a meeting of the foreign ministers of the Friends of Myanmar, and countries that have historic ties or economic assistance with Myanmar would be invited, um, maybe say in Chennai. Um, and to discuss in a holistic way uh, Myanmar's future. So we would talk about the Rohingya issue, but we would also talk about development needs. We'd talk about 
um, how to get back on a path to democracy. And maybe out of that meeting, um, uh, the, the MEA would carry a message with Japan jointly to NEPEDA. The US would work with other countries on, on, on targeting sanctions and coming up with a way to undo sanctions with certain milestones. If we actually did what we're already doing, all of us, but made it very clear we're doing it together with the long-term interest of Myanmar in mind, what a powerful signal. And we could even invite the Chinese. They'd have to sit in the back row, but we could even invite the Chinese. Um, that, that, that's a little bit of a provocative idea, but that's the kind of thing in diplomacy perhaps the Quad could do successfully. But it's worth what you paid for it. I just thought of it. Yeah. No, that's excellent, Mike. Thank you so much for um, vocalizing that idea and coming up with that idea. Uh, I think that's exactly what our audience, our participants, participants uh, uh, you know, what wanted to hear. But I'm afraid we've completely run out of time. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you to all of the three speakers for, um, you know, speaking so eloquently, uh, speaking so forcefully. I, I think uh, the conclusion that we can draw is yes, uh, the very fact that there is a ministerial meeting of the Quad taking place sends a signal of its own. The very fact that the Quad sticks together, gets into the habit of talking and meeting and working with each other in various fields, particularly the maritime field is something which is very important, sends a signal of its own uh, to uh, the people we want such signals to go out to. And uh, there are many other uh, possibilities where the Quad can work together and move ahead. Um, 5G was an example uh, that was given by Mike. And his last idea of a friends of Myanmar is something uh, which is possibly workable. Um, I, I, I don't know if we need to do that at a track two level first before governments can or take ownership of such an idea. Uh, perhaps that may be with the way, but uh, I think the more effective way will be for a government to come for governments to take uh, charge of it. Uh, but I think this was been a fascinating. Thanks to all our three speakers for uh, making the time at uh, unusual hours for Tom, I know, and for Mike, you too. Um, uh, Raja is also is getting late in Singapore. Uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to the Ananta Center for hosting such and the Nippon Foundation for hosting this. And of course, thanks to all our participants for having um, participated in this fully with your questions. We may not have discussions. Thank you. And thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you.